Morning all, let's have a look at game 7 of the 1984 World Championship match between Anatoly Karpov and Gary Kasparov. In this game Anatoly playing white played d4 so by this stage in round 7 he had already won two games maybe Kasparov was already feeling a bit disheartened. In this game we see after d5 c4 e6 a move to the Tarash defense which is a little bit controversial nowadays it's not very popular nowadays so c5 as we've seen on this channel with Kasparov with the black pieces at Nixik a tournament the year before he did very well with the Tarash defense it promises black a lot of peace play especially along the C and E files in exchange for the isolated Queen's pawn and in this game we'll see how Kasparov um, got peace play but um, still could Karpov create difficulties for him so C takes D5 E takes D5 changes the structure so we see already later there's a possibility of a rook being very useful on that E file against E2 White's structural advantage though is that D5 could be weak and squares in, partic in particular like C5 and E5 could be a basis for strategy later as well as that d5 pawn. So g3 is the preferred method of fighting the Tarash. It's invented, I believe, by Rubinstein, a keeper Rubinstein. So knight f6, bishop g2. The Fianchetto here is very, very logical, not only providing king safety, but also the bishop is useful often for d5 to probe d5 or add pressure to d5. Bishop e7 and both sides castle. After knight c3 we see knight c6 and after bishop g5 we see the pawn structure changing again with c takes d4 leaving black with the iqp the isolated queen's pawn no fellow pawn on either side but black has nice bishops and potentially nice rooks on the c and e files Kasparov has done well in the system year before so he's probably feeling quite confident about playing the system here but Anatoly is a master of reducing counterplay. Is it the best thing to be playing against Karpov, this type of system? He plays h6 and we see bishop e3. With the idea potentially sometimes of knight takes and then using c5, which Kasparov has been used to in many games in Nixik the year before where players as white really actually struggled after making use of c5 it wasn't such a big deal even though it seems a logical square potentially on the semi open file against a backward pawn but here after rook e8 Karpov is not tempted for knight takes c6 here he plays queen b3 which is putting a bit of pressure on black's queen side ruling out the bishop moving it seems if the bishop moves then b7 would drop but isn't the queen prone to eviction and useful eviction with this next move knight a5 not only kicking the queen but maybe black will make use of c4 the queen just drops back to c2 so it hasn't really lost time if you consider an offside knight now and the queen might be useful on c2 it's supporting things like knight f5 as well and that can have implications for winning say the dark square bishop okay so is this a time waste going to c2 with two moves with the knight on a5 bishop g4 was played and indeed here knight f5 is made use of straight away with weakened king side with h6 it would have been difficult for black to try and challenge the f5 square uh, if that's we'll do a second pass through this game but uh, it looks very awkward to do anything about f5 in this position in any case so bishop g4 we see knight f5 and now interestingly Kasparov doesn't mind knight takes e7 he doesn't move this bishop away he plays actually rook c8 and the rooks look very very active and aggressive on the c and e files but why would he be giving up the dark square bishop why not move the bishop back well with rook c8 he is pinning this knight which is putting pressure on d5 
and there's potential liabilities here after rook d1. You know, maybe uh, in some lines, well, d5 is going to be quite a problem. And if the bishop moved back, we also could could um, see bishop d4 as well, potentially on the cards, threatening all sorts of things. And also the a7 pawn is a bit of an issue as well. So for many probably tactical reasons, rook c8 was played here, offering the dark square bishop. And it is actually taken here. It's a question of weighing up many different imbalances here to take that bishop or leave the knight on f5. But um, Karpov chose to take the bishop off, removing black's bishop pair. So will black's suffering on the dark squares uh, be increased here, as well as d5 potentially? Well, rook a d1 is played. And here, uh, Kasparov plays a move which intuitively, to many of us, would be seeming quite powerful and related to White's king safety. This next move, queen e8, is only really offering this pawn to be won from the light square bishop. But intuitively, many of us would be feeling a bit worried about giving up our light square bishop here and resulting light square weaknesses. But black is not in a position really to exploit these light square weaknesses, surely. Well, we'll see. Um, for the moment, actually, d5 is not taken immediately. There's also a question about a7, but uh, e2 is under fire as well by Kasparov's move. This, me this next move, which Karpov plays, commits the light square bishop a little bit to keeping I on E2 from a less flexible position, where if white is interested in winning this pawn here, then black will not later react after winning at the light square bishop with bishop H3 evicting the rook and causing some pain maybe for white's king safety. This next move, h3, is very interesting in this respect. If the bishop really covers up the pressure on the e file, then maybe it seems intuitively bishop a7 might even be on the cards. Okay, but we'll check in the second pass of this game. Maybe that leads to the bishop being trapped, or there might be stronger moves like bishop d4 just sitting on the position. Kasparov played bishop h5, and here we see it. Does white really want to weaken the light squares around his king if he goes for this d5 pawn? Okay, it's clear black hasn't got the bishop here anymore, but black still has pressure with his rooks on the c and e files. It seems blasting pressure. Visually, it's almost as if rook takes e3 could be very useful as well here as an exchange sack, but um, bishop takes d5 is played. So Kasparov has the option of taking the bishop immediately, but first he elects to play bishop g6, kicking the queen. Okay, so the queen goes now to c1, Reinforcing e3, maybe against an exchange sack, adding a bit of safety basically to the king if that exchange sack is not possible. And now we see knight takes d5, so rook takes d5. How many of us would be frightened to have some light square weaknesses like this? Winning a pawn like this, but with blasting rooks on the c and e files. But the exchange sack has been extinguished, that major issue has been extinguished, but black now. Centralizes the knight. Kasparov plays knight c4, which also, of course, unpins this knight for a moment. Karpov's next move looks very solid and useful indeed, putting the bishop right in the center. Bishop d4, marking out key squares. In particular, c5 and e5 can be made use of here. So with bishop d4, Kasparov has to prove, perhaps, that he has enough for the pawn. On the other hand, he might think also it's opposite color bishops in any case. 
So is he really going to lose this position with opposite colored bishops? And with him currently having very aggressive rooks, he plays in this position rook e c7. Okay. c3 does seem very nicely reinforced by the bishop. So it looks as though tactics are not really on the card like knight takes b2. But Karpov in this position elects to kick the knight with b3. And we see knight b6. And a forcing move from Anatoly, rook e5. Nothing seems to be falling apart here, even though there's double rooks. It seems fairly solid making use of the dark squares. After queen d7, the queen comes out of that awkward c file now. Powerfully in the center again with queen e3. So if we look at Karpov's pieces, they're nicely centralized here. And this diagonal might be useful in the future. This file might be useful in the future. That queen is supporting both these pieces, basically, for some operations. But Karpov um, may be even a bit concerned by this next move, which Black is weakening himself to kick the rook, his rook, off that e file. Smolov plays f6. Okay, but here, a very solid response, it looks visually, to offer an exchange of rooks. Rook c5. So, where is Black's compensation? For the pawn. In fact, though, hold on a sec. This pawn is loose. Since when did that pawn become loose to the queen? Whoops, let's go back. After queen d7, it was actually a double attack. <laughs> it was a double attack on d4 and h3. But on queen e3, what had happened as well is that uh, this not only is defending but also at uh, attacking potentially b6 and also e8. So if queen, the queen had been taking this pawn, maybe uh, rook e8 is pretty good. But we're going to have to check this out in the second pass. Something like this looks potentially dangerous. For example, this, this might be a disaster scenario with queen e5 attacking c7 and g7. Uh, but if, if king h7, we need to really check this out now. Okay, in the second pass. So, for the moment, that pawn on h3, okay, it was a double attack there. And we saw just queen e3, which looks like a nice centralizing move intuitively. So, f6. Now, once the rook is kicked away from the e file now, uh, Kasparov. He takes on c5, then he does take the option of taking that pawn back. So he is a pawn back. He's got his pawn back. You might think the worst is over. Okay. He's going to be okay after all now. He's not even a pawn down, and it's still opposite colored bishops. Can he lose this? Well, he has weakened his king a little bit with f6. But so has white weakened his king, surely you might ask. Well, let's see what happens here. The thing is, it's white's move here, and white can seize the central file with rook d1. And of course, white is now potentially uh, playing bishop takes b6, and maybe even knight d5 after, to really threaten a lot of things with that knight. In this difficult position, it seems actually, because how can the queen get back usefully here? Kasparov plays a move which doesn't look too hot. It looks as though it belongs in a blitz game, this next move. But how can black actually recover control of the center? Even though he's got his pawn back, his central control seems to be a little bit worse than white's. This knight is not as good as this knight, perhaps. This rook is not is better than this rook. The dark square bishop against the light square bishop, well, is that going to be a problem for black? The queen location, though, that queen is certainly a bit more central than this queen. 
So it seems these pieces have a hint of greater centralization than Black's pieces after the smoke is cleared from the previous stuff. So this next move looks looks out of place, h5. What's the actual idea of it, you might ask? Well, if the idea is certainly h4 to try and undermine white, it's distinguished with this next move, which looks another powerful centralizing move from Anatoly. Threatening rook h4 and tactically protecting it, it seems rook takes c5 with rook d8 check and then taking on c5. So again, the central control of white's pieces looks better than black's. Knight d7, is the knight going to be useful though? Is it going to come to e5, for example? Well, that stopped with uh, bishop d6. So the bishop is usefully controlling these dark squares now, particularly e5. We see bishop f7 here. And now the knight increases its influence now with knight d5 immediately threatening knight e7 check. There's no meaningful entry point. The rook is cut off c1 here at the moment. So knight e7 check is on the cards. Here, Sparth believes it is important to get rid of that knight. There's also another threat here, such as knight f4 attacking the queen, and maybe also. No, the queen is tied down now because of rook c1. So Sparth elects that to take this knight. We'll look at the options in the second pass. He takes the knight here. Rook takes d5. Okay, so it's a bishop versus knight scenario to prove which piece will be better. Xbarth plays a6, finally getting rid of this as an issue, so maybe the rook can at least go to c2 or something, to potentially one day without losing a7 for nothing. Uh, but the queen on h3 needs um, is, is a potential problem. And you might think, okay, h5 might be a potential problem at some point. Here, Karpov plays bishop f4. Okay, white's pieces look nicer in the center. Black exert is exerting continual tactical pressure, but bishop f4 extinguishes some of that by helping control c1 a bit more, thus freeing up the queen. And actually, this is a bit of a cold shower wake up, this move. Because with bishop f4, then this queen is free, maybe it's come to e7, and, and that looks very, very dangerous. Attacking the knight, attacking g7, all of a sudden black's king safety is being asked a few questions here, and it previously wasn't. Previously it was white, sort of, being a bit concerned to, to move any piece of that getting mated here, because of that queen on h3, installed on h3, kind of goal hanging queen here. But here, queen e7, white's going to return the compliment by having queen next to the king pretty soon. The knight goes back to f8. Doesn't look too good to do that sort of move. In principle, putting the knight back to the first rank. Another centralizing move now. Queen d3. And with that knight on f8, I mean, Karpov is now interested in getting to that first row, pinning that knight, and getting these pawns. That seems to be the emphasis now in this position. Queen g4, as though maybe h4 could be useful, but uh, with the queen pinning g3, but f3 evicts the queen. Queen g6. Now, queen takes g6 might be a mistake of the notion of to take is a mistake, as we hear sometimes on YouTube. Here, instead of taking the queen, Karpov improves his position slightly with king f2, getting out of this pin. So ready to meet h4 with other options, like g takes, which wouldn't exist if the pawn was pinned, and doesn't mind black taking the queen and then playing on in that position. A little bit more of an improvement than queen takes g6, which springs the knight straight into action. Okay, Xpath plays an active move, rook c2. 
forwarded by that Queen G6 protecting the rook here. And now taking up another option of centralization in Queen E3. Okay, but with the King on F2, is it more likely now for White to invade now with Queen E7, Rook D8? And this, this Rook's not helping, of course, that first rank now. So the rook stumbles back actually here, it doesn't take on a2. I assume black would be obliterated on rook takes a2. But we'll check that out in the second pass, because queen e7, rook d8 look very good. The rook goes back to help the fence, but we see queen e7 anyway. And also attacking the b7 pawn, which is not of total insignificance. Couple would just like to win these pawns on the queen side and win the end game if possible. After b5, okay, we see rook d8 forcing off the rooks and leaving a very nasty pin against the knight. So, with all this smoke clearing, what has Karpov got here? He's carved out, it seems, a very clear advantage. White is now threatening bishop d6 driving the queen back, giving the queen a maybe a very useful free hand for a moment at least, as black tries to unravel from this horrendous pin on the back row. So queen f7, we see bishop d6. How does Gasparov get out of this pin? Well, he has to move his pawn so he can move the king away to unpin. So he plays g5, another option that has was g6, but he plays g5. But there's one move here which might make all the difference now in this game. Queen a8, keeping the pin as black tries to wriggle away. He's going to lose a pawn. That's going to be the cost of unpinning here. Quite painful. This did not happen in Nixick the year before because Borov had great games in the Tarash and even great end games. King g7, and now he's going a pawn down. Queen takes a6, and b5 is under fire as well. Can't leave white with two connected past pawns for nothing, surely. Queen d7 is played here, not trying to move the knight. And now, after bishop takes, there's a weakness of the last move here. f6 doesn't have to even. Need, need, B5 is protected by F6. Ouch. He's losing another pawn as well. G5 after that. This never happened at Nixick for the Tarash, but here Kasparov has had to resign now. He resigns. Did he not have dynamic chances, you might ask? He's now free down, depressingly, in this match of 1984. Free down against Anatoly Karpov. Karpov has had a near 10-year reign at the top since 1975 as world champion. It's now 1984, and he's obliterating Kasparov. 3-0 in this match. Let's have a look at this game again with our engine friends. So, was White really better all along? The dynamic play was it not really worth that much? The Tarash gen generated. This looks like a fairly standard opening position up to here. Opening sequence beaten many times, beaten track. So Bishop e3, the engine likes Bishop e3, among other things. Uh, it's one of the best moves. Bishop e3 is going to be a rechargeable blockade on d4, making use of c5. So we see rook e8. And now this delicate little move, queen b3, which is not mentioned by the engine. Queen b3. As though knight a5 initially looked like a problem, but still white's got the advantage. White just drops back the queen to c2 here, the engine thinks. And that's what happened, knight a5. Oh, what does black do? If he doesn't play knight a5, what does he do? What is he going to do? Recharge the blockade? Justify bishop take, bishop e3? There's going to be options for bishop f6 and knight d5. The isolated queen's pawn is going to be a nightmare here in this position, surely. Is he going to offer bishop, off the, offer queen b7? 
doesn't have to be even taken. Sort out B2 first, maybe. Or even if, if it is taken, is that a big deal? He just takes on A7. This position is unpleasant. So he goes for Knight A5. A Knight on the rim is dim, but it's justified here to kick the Queen, surely. But it goes to C2. And now we've got this Knight F5 idea. So Bishop G4 is chosen. And we see Knight F5, which isn't mentioned. Is this really a good move? looks from an engine point of view to be a near blunder. Knight f5. And then the engine likes it all of a sudden. What is going on? At a certain depth now it's light. Now what if bishop f8? What would happen here? I mentioned bishop d4. That might not even be the strongest. h3 first. If the bishop doesn't take on it, say, say we go with bishop h5. Rook F D one. That D five pawn's being tortured, as one would expect in the Tarash. G four to free the Queen up, even though it's slightly weakening the King a little bit more in theory. Queen B one getting out of the pin, which means D five is now really, really tortured. Knight C four. Bishop D four might be an option, but even Knight D five now looks good to the engine. Knight takes d5 here. Good circumstances to win that d5 pawn. What counterplay does black have here? Better for white. So this bishop survived, but uh, black has the bishops. But what points are they if one's like not doing much on g6 in this line and d5 is dropping? Take this a little bit further. It's not pleasant. So we have this decision which maybe was weighed up carefully uh, that after knight f5, rook c8, just give up the dark square bishop. Xpraf snaps it immediately. To take is a mistake, you might ask. Doesn't it improve that position slightly? Well, okay, but it is taking its concrete, you know, it's it's taking the bishop pair of black's position. And it's the, the dark squares which are going to be a lot of operations on. You don't want a dark square bishop. Sometimes that's useful to get rid of the dark square bishop. So rook ad1 and white can still torture d5 here. Perhaps there's a reason the Tarish is not popular nowadays at grandmaster level. The Slav defense or Groomfield is preferred in 2012. So okay, here black basically is, is virtually uh, sacking a pawn with queen e8. It seems in the spirit of the Tarash uh, to laugh at White's play for d5 and eventually just give it up as a pawn sacrifice, as a gambit. Could it have been taken immediately here instead of h3? If bishop takes d5, then bishop h3 immediately. And may, we might be seeing the horror of rook e3 here. So say rook f e1, rook takes e3. Karpov is not going to allow this play. He's not a common garden grandmaster, he's a super grandmaster. He's been on top of the world for nearly 10 years. He's not going to give black play like this. Why take unnecessary risks? He plays fine precision moves to remove counterplay. He doesn't want this kind of scenario. This might even offer black some sort of horrendous tactical com combination. Okay, even though the engine can see it, or it can, can can navigate to to a, a, a to a small edge, tiny edge, but no, he plays the move h3 first, take time to win d5 without huge amounts of counterplay from black. Take it slowly. So bishop h5, ruling out the bishop h3s, now take on d5. Or is it a good idea? The engine says even more slowly here, leave d5. The engine is looking at rook c1 and queen f5. Rook c1? Absurd. The rooks just come from there. Why would the rook want to change its mind? Let's have a look at rook c1. B6? Really? Is bishop takes a7 really threatened here? Let's test that. If knight e4, for example, takes... Not really bishop takes a7, surely. There's always b6s. Queen a4. This looks to be better for white slightly. But anyway, 
has not ventured too far into different variations. So bishop h5, the pawn is taken. And the engine doesn't mind, doesn't mind, but maybe doesn't like it actually here to take that pawn immediately. There's also this queen f5. What does queen f5 do, you might ask? What about bishop g6, queen f4, keeping a lock on the dark squares? Rook c4, rook d4, knight h5, queen f3. We've got a lock on d4 here. Maybe this is more pleasant from an engine point of view. And now we can take on d5 without so much cards to play again. The same principle taken to an extreme. Rook e3 doesn't seem that harmful here. Does rook take c4, in fact? Okay, here the engine likes white better than the game continuation. So taking the pawn here looks premature as well from an engine point of view. Even rook c1, it looks absurd to play rook c1. Rook c1. But what it does do, I mean, that idea of queen a4, let's see why that would fail here. Because of the invasion, ah, oh, bishop e2. So rook c1 did seem to support the idea, rather strangely, in this position, of, of playing potentially queen a4. Ah, okay. We've lost Endune Sport. Hold on a sec. Pardon me. Okay, while well, well, that's unloading and reloading. Um, yeah, I'm, I think this is a very important game uh, from the evolution of style perspective. We have a clash, basically, of a very dynamic player as Black playing a dynamic opening, which he's done very well, uh, like the year before in Nixic. Sixpath playing this Tarish defence. He's got active rooks, he's got an active position. Sixpath plays a surprising uh, move which in a way weakens his king but wins a pawn. So it's interesting to see the dynamic counterplay being squashed. It's a clash of styles. Uh, Karpov, is he really going to suck the life out of Black's position? It's a really, really interesting game. Just ideologically here, what we're seeing here, that Black is given this dynamism in exchange for the pawn. Okay, but now it's Karpov's job to try and reduce the counterplay. So Queen C1 reduces all the threats of Rook E3. So Black takes on D5 here. Well, where are there, were there better options? Bishop E4 looks looks like an absurd idea. Bishop takes Knight takes. It looks painful though because Knight takes G3 might be an idea here. Bishop takes A7. Isn't knight takes g3 on? No, no, the bishop's just moved from e3, it's not a liability. Knight takes, b takes, rook takes. Black looks to be doing okay there. Maybe that's better than game continuation. Okay, it's an interesting possibility. But he takes on d5 with the knight. Rook takes. And now we see the aggressive looking knight c4. But bishop d4, and it seems to be. Well, was that a mistake? Because it seems bishop d4 and now the engine really likes white's position all of a sudden. What's transformed here? We're over at half a pawn advantage with opposite colored bishops. Nothing better than rook ec7? Seriously, there's nothing better than rook ec7? Wasn't that a waste of putting the, the queen and rook battery together? So why is b3 played here? Actually, there doesn't seem to be a major huge threat and on the cards here, say so it seems King H two is also possible. Let's say Bishop E four. Okay, this this looks fancy uh, variation. Okay, but uh, the knight can be evicted. Why not evict the knight? It's exerting pressure. So Karpov elects to evict that knight with B three. Okay, and now he starts these slow centralizing moves. Rook E five, and now Queen E three with two batteries being created. If black didn't play f6, well, say he did take on h3, that's the question here, asked earlier. Check. Now, I think as mentioned, this is a disaster, this variation, because of queen e5, forking g7 and c7 intuitively. Now, if king h7, what would be the problem here? Rook takes, rook takes, Rook d1. It's slightly better for white, but maybe Sparth didn't like it. 
but as she, as she seems um, playable. Any queen f queen e five to play f six. Um, so so anyway, f six played immediately, and we see rook takes, and white maintains a small advantage even after giving back the pawn, because he's got this powerful move now, rook d one, which the engine really likes. It looks so beautiful in many respects. Rook d one, a simple move. But it shows quality difference between the rooks. The rook is very useful in that default, and it's very annoying because black cannot challenge it. So after all this smoke's cleared, opposite color bishops, what can black do about this centralized rook and this centralized queen? Slightly annoying pieces. He plays h5, which, as I say, it doesn't it doesn't look in context. This move. I think we're going to see an evaluation shift. And no, I haven't checked this game beforehand. I think we're going to see. Black going a bit worse off to h5. Yes. Just intuitive, it doesn't look like such a positive move. Any benefits are extinguished anyway with rook d4. Okay. So what could black play instead? Well, bishop e8 to c6, is that an idea? Bishop e8. Queen e7, bishop c6, that looks very logical to use the queen on h3. And black might even be. Promising to be better here. E4, knight d7. I think black's problems are solved. If if the knight gets to e5, that would be delicious. So that has to be stopped. This looks about equal. So maybe this was a missed opportunity for Xbarf right here to make use of the queen with pieces rather than this battering ram pawn, which is locked down with rook d4. Okay, so knight d7, that locks bishop. Locks out the knight from e5, and now we see knight d5 with with actual concrete threats. What else is there? If if it's not taken, what is the danger here? Is it knight f4 or knight e7 or rook h4 even? Knight e7 apparently is the main danger attacking the rook. If the rook dared move, as an example. Ouch. Oh dear. We have a crunching tactic here. Boys and girls, we have a crunching tactic because the black king is about to get mated with the rook and knight in this variation. If queen e6, we can just take, and if takes, it's going to be mate. Wow, that queen is being used as an excuse to get at the black king after h5. So h5 intuitively didn't look right. And tactically, it looks disastrous in this continuation with rook d4. What does what does black actually do here? It looks busted. The engine is suggesting a full rook sacrifice. So knight takes c8. Okay, no, an exchange set, not knight g. I thought knight g4, but knight g4 is is no is no problem. Apparently. So that looks horrendous. Knight e7. So that's why perhaps bishop takes d5 is a box move in informator. Only move. Bishop takes d5. The box symbol. Only move. Okay, the knight stumbles back soon. So a6. Was that a7 pawn actually? Isn't it's not really a, a target at the moment. Um, b6 is also mentioned by the engine. Or knight f8. Uh, okay, but uh, I suppose black wants to free up the rook potentially without losing his queen side. And he's taking pawns off off the dark square bishops. Target practice later. So knight f8, queen d3 being made possible by that bishop. Prophylaxis against rook c1. Knight e knight e6 is also potentially on the cards. Queen g4 again, make, trying to maybe justify that h5 move again. F3 was it necessary? Was f3 actually necessary? If we play a move like king h2, then maybe h4 is, is potentially a little bit dangerous. If black can even swap off here, pawns. Doesn't seem as bad, actually. So this 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 move, f3, okay, queen g6. We see king f2, very good move, not, not taking on g6. The take is a mistake here. Look at the evaluation shifts concretely. If we take the queens, That's almost like equalized. If we're forced to allow double pawns here, why? Why not move the bishop, you might ask. 
example rook c2 black's been given too much time here to get in so yeah king f2 okay so we see now the invasion move rook c2 which might not be the best it looks as though once that was a small blunder here maybe taking for black is okay to try and get in rook c2 or something well rook c2 here rook d8 surely if rook c2 here well, rook d8 a4 a3 looks about equal again what is white doing here looks about equal so it's, I suspect there's a blunders here small little blunders like rook c2 don't help white because Marv could have just got the queens off here and a rook on the seventh why not why did Kasparov keep the queens on interesting so rook c2 and the queens are now kept on with queen e3 Offer, offering a2 I think that would be the disaster because of queen a, e7 let's, let's take this pawn as an example okay queen e7 might not be the threat though queen f7 evicting the queen and attacking the rook but the threat might be actually rook d8 okay and then you might think, well, queen f7, then what? What is bishop d6 here? That knight is being victimized. And if king f7, there's there's queen e8. That's that's amazing, actually. So um, so rook d8 would be uh, looks crushing, absolutely brutal, crushing this pin, pin and win. Okay. So rook c8 defends against. Rook d8, rather humbly coming back to defend. But now we do see queen e7. So you might think, well, actually, isn't queen f7 a resource here? Actually, queen f7 is mentioned by the engine as the main move here. But it's going to drop h5. That's a slight price to pay. That might be better for white. Not the sort of position you want against Anatoly Karpov, maybe. So Kasparov plays b5, and we end up with this horrendous pin scenario now in this final episode of the game after rook d8, which might not even be the strongest move from an engine point of view. Queen b7 might be stronger. Let's give give the engine a bit of time here to think about rook d8 or queen b7. It seems rook d8 intuitively is good. Lock down a piece, tie a piece down with an absolute pin, a pin which has to be fulfilled an absolute pin with rook d8 seems the logical thing to do but queen b7 is, is material hunting maybe let's let's check this out out of interest why is this more incisive here queen a6 is possible keeping an eye on c8 and getting the pin anyway okay white's better here anyway so anyway, may, maybe it's a choice, preference choice. White's, white's better here anyway. White's clearly better here anyway. How can black wrench away from this pin without losing material? It's painful. It's all downhill now. He's losing material by force. He probably didn't improve things with queen d7. It's, it's lost anyway, I guess. At this level, if takes here, queen b5. That's, that's forget it. Yeah. So that that was uh, that was basically it. Crunch three nil up against Kasparov, who many people vote the strongest plat that ever lived. Okay. <laughs> Hope you got something out of it. Possibly this explains partly why the Tarish never really got too popular after 1984 as a defense to d4 comments or questions on youtube thanks very much